We're talking today about Aristotle's logic, about categorical logic, the logic, that is, of categorical statements, where a categorical statement is a statement that relates to categories. And a category is a kind or a term, a general term, a kind or a class of things, as opposed to a single individual name. So, for example, the name Socrates does not count as a category because it refers not to a whole class of things, but just to one particular individual, Socrates himself. Now, when we form a categorical statement, we take two categories. One will be called the subject, S for short, and the other will be called the predicate, P for short. And we can combine them in four different ways. And those four different ways represent the corners of this square. We can say, for example, all S are P, and that's what we have in the upper left corner of the square there, marked with an A. Or we can say no S are P, and that we find in the upper right corner of the square, that's marked with a capital E. In the lower left, we have a capital I type of claim, some S are P, and in the lower right, O claims some S are not P. Now along the sides of the square and along the diagonals of the square, we have labels that express the relations that obtain among the different kinds of categorical statement. The bulk of this lecture will be explaining what these terms mean and how to understand this square, this famous square called the square of opposition. So take another minute, get this square firmly in your mind, and we'll begin. Okay. Well, let's talk about the different relations that are encoded here in the square. We saw that A and E are related by the relation of contrariness. And the thing to remember about the contrariness relation is that no two contraries can both be true. So let's think about a concrete example. Suppose we pick as our A claim, all dogs are animals. Well, then the associated E claim would, of course, be no dogs are animals. And I think if we think about those two claims, we can see pretty readily that they cannot both be true. After all, if all dogs are animals, it could hardly be the case that no dogs are, and vice versa. Now, in our particular example, one of our two claims, namely the A claim, all dogs are animals, happened to be true. But that is an artifact of the example. We said only that they cannot both be true. We said only that two contraries cannot both be true but they can both be false. So for example, if we had a different example, using say, S for students and P for poor people, well then we'd have all students are poor people and the associated E claim would of course be no students are poor people. Now, it's certainly true that those cannot both be true, but they could of course both be false and indeed they are both false. For it is neither true that all students are poor, nor true that no students are. Some students are poor people and other students are not. Okay, so the point about contrariness holds. They cannot both be true, but they can both be false. Let's talk about the other relations. Relating the I claim and the O claim is the relation of subcontrariness. So if we stick with our example of dogs and animals, the I claim would be some dogs are animals, and the O claim would be some dogs are not animals. Now, the thing to remember about the subcontrary relation is that they cannot both be false. Okay? So either the I claim or the O claim for any S and any P must be true. And in fact, they can, of course, both be true. But they cannot both be false. That's the point about subcontrariness. Now the relation of contradictoriness combines corners. So A claims are the contradictories of O claims, E claims are the contradictories of I claims. And the point about contradictoriness is that one is true and the other is false, always. Okay. <clears throat> so for example, if our A claim is all dogs are animals, then the O claim is some dogs are not animals, 
And those two claims are such that one of them must be true and the other must be false. Of course, in our case, the true one is that all dogs are animals. Think about the same example applied to E and I claim now. If our E claim is no dogs are animals, then the I claim is some dogs are animals. Which one of those is true? Well, of course, the I claim is some dogs are animals. So notice there that when we say that some dogs are animals is true, there's no presumption that uh, some means some but not all. Okay? If all dogs are animals, then of course it's equally true that some dogs are animals. That's how we're understanding our terms. Finally, we've got the relation of subalternation. And subalternation connects an A claim with its associated I claim and an E claim with its associated O claim. Now, the point to remember about subalternation is this. When the A claim is true, then so must the I claim be true. And similarly, when the E claim is true, then so must its subalternate O claim be true. So that's the lesson about subalternation, and the point works in the opposite direction as well, but for falsity. That is, if an I claim is false, then so must its associated A claim be false. And if an O claim is false, then so must its associated E claim be false. Okay? But it doesn't work the other way around. So you can go from the truth of an A claim to the truth of an I claim, or from the falsity of an I claim to the falsity of an A claim, but you cannot go from the falsity of an A claim to the falsity of an I claim, or from the truth of an I claim to the truth of the A claim. Got it? We have to mind our P's and Q's here when we do our logic. In fact, minding our P's and Q's seems to be derived from doing logic, because we often use P's and Q's in other forms of logic. Okay, that's the four relations. Contrary, subcontrary, subalternation, and contradictory. Now, in addition to those four relations, there are also three operations on categorical statements that I'd like to talk about. And those three operations are, first, conversion, second, obversion, and third, contraposition. Excuse me. Okay, so first, conversion. Well, to find the converse of a claim, all you have to do is swap the subject and the predicate for one another. So, for example, if we start with a claim that says uh, some students are poor people, well, in order to find the converse of that claim, we just swap the subject and predicate, and we get some poor people are students. So that's easy enough to do. We can find the converse of any claim simply by swapping the subject term and the predicate term, one for the other. Now, the interesting point about converses is that sometimes you can preserve the truth value of the original statement by doing that. That is, sometimes the converse of a statement will say exactly the same thing, in different words, as the original statement. And those kinds of statements that have that feature are I claims and E claims. Okay? That is to say, an E claim and its converse always say the same thing, and an I claim and its converse always say the same thing. But not so for A claims and not so for O claims. So, for example, if we start with an I claim, something like, uh, some dogs are hairy animals, well, if that's true, then it must also, of course, be true that some hairy animals are dogs. Because what we're saying, in effect, is that there's something in the intersection of the dog term and the hairy animals term. And so it doesn't matter in which order we say that. Some dogs are hairy animals, or some hairy animals are dogs. And similarly, for E claims, if we have it that, say, no dogs are cats, well, then clearly that's equivalent to saying that no cats are dogs. It could hardly be that no cats are dogs, and yet some cats are dogs. Okay? So, E claims and I claims are equivalent to their converses, but not so for A claims and O claims.